um, welcome um, fellow PMI um, chapter members. Um, today we have with us Linda Carter and Dave Davis. And as you can see on the screen here, they're going to be presenting how excellence and collaboration creates better project plans. A little bit about Linda and Dave. Linda is the president of Competitive Edge Consulting, an, art, uh, an author, public speaker, and it works on building and sharing critical thinking skills with a focus on project management. And then Dave Davis is a with Ohio Health, and he's a senior project manager, a thought leader in project management, agile, and benefits realization. So with that, Linda, Dave, welcome. I'll hand it off to you for um, excellence and collaboration. All right. Well, great. Dave and I are always happy to collaborate together, um, bringing you today some uh, some of our thoughts on collaboration as, it's, as it is. Um, so hey, Dave hey, and I, hey, yes. Linda, one other point I forgot to mention is for the audience, given that audio um, is disabled, please use the Q&A in the session on your right hand menu in the session area. There's a Q&A for any questions, feedback to Dave and Linda. Thank you. Thanks for that reminder. Um, Brian and Dave and I would love this whole session to be collaborative. We don't want to just um, have you guys kind of sit back and listen to us speak for an hour. We'd love for you to jump in and ask questions, um, uh, challenge thoughts and ideas. So jump in at any time, put something in the Q&A. We'll, we will address it as we go through the course materials. Um, well, I was going to say, uh, together, I think Dave and I have well over 60 years of project management experience together. Um, so collaboratively, we always bring bring a lot to the room. Yes, um, I won't say how that 60 years is divided. But um, <laughs> as you'll know, this is a collaborative session. This is not a well-rehearsed broadcast to you. This is meant dialogue, discussion, and one of the outputs of the whole topic here is better project plans, and that's through communication and dialogue. Uh, one of the things that the new PMI guide with principles and et cetera, and it's actually a performing domain about reducing uncertainty and the best way to reduce the cone of uncertainty is through dialogue, conversation. And that's exactly what we're hoping to have from this. I will be trying to monitor the Q&A to, to let folks know, I am not the fastest monitor in the history of the world. So your question may be there for a little bit before I say, hey, Linda, I got a question, but bear with me. And um, clearly, th this is we're going to need to learn together. There, I'm sure there's going to be a few things we'll talk about here that neither Linda or I planned on before we started. So you're getting, what was it? it used to be called unplugged, right? Linda is you know, kind of a funny looking Eric Clapton, but we'll go with it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, let's just, oh, my mouse is a little slippery here. Let's just start with our purpose. So Dave talked about takeaways, right? What do we want to focus on? We really want to focus on the value of collaboration and that it can increase um, engagement with our teams, our stakeholders, our sponsors. Um, it will help us build better uh, agendas. Um, we're going to talk about roles and responsibilities for collaboration. Um, and then talk about using some of the project management techniques or best practices in a collaborative environment. So we're going to um, kind of work through the why of collaboration, the how of collaboration, and then give some examples um, and end up with some some reinforcement thoughts. We think about the mindset of collaboration. Yeah. And I think it's safe to say we're also going to talk about some of the spirit of collaboration and how the trust in those other elements as a team, as a team leader, you foster are going to drive successful collaboration. I mean, you you can get together on a web meeting and Bro. present things, but that's not necessarily collaboration. Collaboration, our team members working together, sharing ideas, thoughts, generating results. Yeah, from that perspective, you know, that, again, it's a mindset. So it doesn't matter what your role is, right? You can be a team member with a small core team or sub team. Um, you can be running a project or a program. Um, you can facilitate those good collaboration um, in any of those environments. So um, I wanted to start, I always like to start with some data, some, some, someone's opinion other than mine or Dave's that says, hey, this is why this is a good thing. Um, so the data we have here is pre-COVID. So COVID impacted findings are still being researched. So we're still seeing kind of what's the impact now in terms of collaboration, communication, and project management um, in a more remote setting 
as opposed to pre-COVID when when there was very little remote work and most of the work, a majority of the work was um, face to face in the office. So again, these are these the data points are um, pre work from home um, as normal when we were all coming into the office. Um, and what it found was that workplace co collaboration drives innovation. It increases innovation by 15%. Although I'd love to see, I don't know how you measure innovation, but maybe more innovative ideas, more innovative approaches. Um, and even more powerfully, it reduces time to market by up to 20%. Um, so definitely a good thing. If you're interested in more of the statistics, we've got the link there so you can take a look at the other data that came from that research. But um, there's definitely data to prove that getting people together to have a conversation improves communication, value added communication. I'd like to say not just talking, but talking purposely and intentfully, right? Um, and helps us to get to, to understand and develop better plans. So, also from that um, research, we there's a few more statistics I wanted to share, and that is that 94% of us believe the lack of alignment impacts outcome, right? So when we when we have when we're not collaborating, we all have our own stories in our mind about what our approach is or what success looks like. Um, we're not aligned. That's going to impact our outcome. Um, and in that research at all, 86% cite the lack of collaboration for project failures, the left hand not knowing what the right hand's doing, right? All this um, lack of good collaboration and communication um, has a huge impact on our ability to be successful as project managers. And I think when you read these statistics, I don't know how you feel, Dave, but when I saw these numbers, I was like, um, maybe I couldn't come up with the numbers, but I could, I could have probably come up with the results, right? Uh, when we're not talking, we're not working together, you know, we're, we're going to have different visions of what the success or the approach looks like, and we're less likely um, to have a alignment of outcome um, or successful projects. Yeah. One that I think is missing there is it shortens your time to market, too, by having the collaboration and those dialogues. You know, you're not asynchronous or we talk for five minutes oh forgot to mention this and come back 20 minutes later or whatever but uh, yeah optimize it one other thing and i like to joke i have a real good friend who's a very very, very involved in agile world scrum and in 2019 he preached and preached and preached and preached how you had to have collated teams you know no way can you not have everybody together k's and commons and all that and now since then, and I think a lot of us were amazed at how well this adapted through COVID, et cetera. But he's now preaching that it can be done virtually, that you can have people offshore collaborating real time with a, an onshore group. And that it's not the technology, again, it's the mindset, the atmosphere, how the project lead, by the way, Pinbot Guide 7 doesn't really call them project managers too much or now project lead because you could be a quote scrum master, a project manager, a product owner, janitor, all those things <laughs> that we've always been. But it's that atmosphere and the safety, the uh, I guess psychological safety, diversity, inclusion, all those things that help make collaboration work. Yeah, and Dave's really getting at the heart of what I hope you guys take away from this session is that there is some infrastructure and some tactical things, but it is very much the mindset that will help drive it, right? If you don't have the mindset, all the tactical things we talk about, um, we won't be effective or successful at. All right, so what does collaboration do for us? I think Dave hinted to all these things, right? It drives employee engagement. Don't we love to be purposeful in what we do and engaged in our work and be passionate about it, right? So the collaboration allows us to do that. It allows us to, to be more creative, more innovative. It allows us to share and transfer knowledge, right? If, if I, I'm not working so much in a silo, uh, by the way, silos are one of those things that hinder effective communication because when we're kind of isolated in a silo, and again, not physically necessarily, but mentally kind of isolated in the function that we do. Um, we don't really understand the whole picture. We're not bringing as much value um, into, to the to the approach of the equation. So this knowledge sharing and knowledge transfer is really important. And all of that drives value realization. Hey, Linda, did I interject a second? Brian made a comment in the Q&A about he's also experienced the success with the remote, a little scary at first, but he misses the team members in person. And I think 
to add on with your knowledge transfer piece, one of the challenges that we have as we collaborate and run these meeting center is to get that quote osmonic communication or the tribal the tribal knowledge in that to be shared. That um, we need to have the environment where people can tell their war stories. Um, may add a minute to your meeting, but who knows where it'll pay dividends in the background and maybe never. Well, and a lot of that gets to that gets to that building to the environment, right? And um, it yeah. is it is great to think about remote work has been effective. I've actually worked remote for about thirty years, so I love that people have been not how, why or how, but people have been kind of thrown into the ocean that I've been swimming in for a long time, and seeing that it's a, a very effective and it's an alternative approach, um, and it can work really well. But like anything, you just have to be more intentful, right? Um, and being able to see people in person, that's um, that's really valuable in any environment, right? Even even if you're working with a geographically remote team, the ability to get together every once in a while physically can become uh, really helpful in your ability to work together. So when we see what's on the slide here, we think about what it increases. Um, I think it's important to understand, too, that there are things that hinder communication, <clears throat> and that is some sort of like anything that isolates us, right? So um, working in silos, um, it could be working in cubicles or offices, um, anything that um, uh, requires us to be more intentional about how we connect to others, um, makes it a little more challenging to be collaborative, but those are, those are all things that we can overcome. So we think about the kind of overcoming them, I, and uh, maybe Dave, Dave wants to talk to some of these things. We're going to think about these are these are like what does collaboration look like? It's physical, but it's also um, well. If you read the last bullet, right? Collaboration does not require us to be in the same space. Yep. You know, and there's technologies. Microsoft Teams, a great example of a platform <laughs> that allows you to have a combination of chats, meetings recording the meetings, saving transcripts, a lot of different things to be able to go back and forth and reference and et cetera. And you can even have dogs as part of your collaboration environment. And that's one of the wonderful things that bring personality and life to it. And you know, I, I think it's interesting. You may, I've been involved in many, and I'm sure you all have too, where somebody uh, gets an interruption and it spawns an interesting little tidbit of conversation that throughout the never that's the call people are referencing back to it so you know embrace embrace the things that happen and uh, try to add value from them so thank you dave for calling out my dog <laughs> sparking in the background i appreciate and i think it's true too i've been on conference calls before where someone's dog comes and sits on their lap or the cat comes and sits next to the computer and what it does is it humanizes those people allows you to kind of connect and build some of those non-physical attributes that we miss when we don't see people in in person right it's not we're not machines trying to be efficient and try and get things done we're human beings and we're we're trying to relate to each other to be efficient and get things done okay move on all right Oop. so when we think about and this is again what we've been talking about right these what are what are these characteristics how do we build this dave's alluded to the word trust trust is huge right we want to be able to um, have good conversations we want to be able to share ideas in a way uh, that is comfortable that feels safe so we need you know positive recognition and again this can happen at all levels in the organization right we, we say to people hey thanks for showing up thanks for your idea thanks for listening to my idea right the more we can create this um, uh, a positive environment the more people want to participate in it. I'm sure we've all had experience with teams where we're like, oh, I don't want to be in this meeting or I don't want to be in this room with these people because it's um, because you can feel the tension, right? But if we can create some positive energy, uh, now that's a team that we want to be with that we want to collaborate with. And exactly. And to bring this back to a quote PMI piece, those of you who are familiar with Discipline Agile has what they call their mindset, which is a set of promises, guidelines, et cetera. There are a couple things in there directly related to collaboration. One is collaborate proactively. I mean, that's a, a guideline. Another one is create psychological safety, embracing diversity and inclusion. And those are things that I think are a little bit easier to do in the collaboration world. And then there's one 
try to create a atmosphere of joy. That sounds a little hokey, but that's kind of what we're trying to do here. I mean, as you guys probably have noticed, Linda and I have done this together before, and we kind of like to banter back and forth with each other, but that's probably more a sign of mutual respect and that psychological safety than anything else. And 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 the desire for joy, right? I mean, how yeah. much of your how much of our life do we spend at work? Like, l let's make work joyful, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Yeah. So you know, uh, just some pieces around that, right? We talked about knowledge sharing, but sharing credit, sharing sharing blame, holding each other accountable and responsible, making sure that we're listening to everyone's voice, that we have a, a common goal. Right. That overall, it's that safe environment and the trust is the glue, I think, that holds all that together. Yeah. So we we need to think about um, and look at look at the teams. <coughs> excuse me, that we're working with and and kind of audit ourselves against some of this environmental pieces and see, like, is there something we're doing well? Is there something that we need to change? <coughs> excuse me. All right. So what what's it look like? What's the process of building collaborative work, whether it's a workshop or um, a meeting or just some sort of process we're working through? Everything requires some preparation, um, the event or the work to occur, and then some reflection or post work activity. So when we think about it, and we mentioned in this um, uh, objectives, getting to like, how do we build an agenda? Think of, I like to think of an agenda like a mini project plan for my work event, um, and that becomes, uh, you know, the the schedule of what's happening and who needs to be involved and how much time things need to take. So we always want to begin with the end in mind and understand, you know, what what's our purpose? Um, what is our approach? And Dave, do you want to talk a little bit about design approach? Um, yeah, I mean, how, how are we going to work together? There's a couple different pieces within design in, gen in general. You got to be aware of your atmosphere, what the people are, their maturity level, the context of, of where things are. And so design, what is the best way to go? I mean, are we going to do sticky note things? How are we going to manage those? Some of those other ways to elicit um, the information and get people to be contributors how to maybe avoid follow the leader things. And so mentally prepare to, to deal with those things. And so can you design the activities, structure your agenda where you're able to deal with some of those things up front? We got a slide a little bit later where we talk about some ground rules. And so the design process, make sure that we all understand how we're gonna play together during this collaboration event. Thank you, thanks, yeah. When we think about participants too, we want to think about people who have knowledge. We want to think about people who are um, have ability, people who are decision makers, um, and kind of figure out what's the mix of the right people in the in the in the in the event to, to work together. Right? We want to give people time and um, have priority for them to to show up. And then if we're using tools um, or sticky notes, uh, we you know we have to make sure that we configure the tools properly or buy the sticky notes that need to be purchased. Right, so that so that we're that, that the infrastructure is in place, so when the work happens, we can focus on the work and not on the logistics and the and the infrastructure. Yeah, note about a comment about sticky notes. Don't overthink them. I've been involved in some. Well, orange ones have to be this, pink ones need to be that, blue ones need to be, and you end up in st sticky note hell, for lack of a better term. But. So don't try to build too much complexity into it. Focus on getting the work and the ideas, not on what color sticky note is it on. Thanks for sharing that. So when you see some of our photographs that we're sharing later, you'll see that the colors are <laughs> meaningless. <laughs> Which is important. And the other thing in a collaborative work, and there's some neat tools with sticky notes, like on the Miro, the M-I-R-R-O, I'm more familiar with them than Miro. But you know, you can take sticky notes, put a voting area around there and have people vote on them. So it gives you some capabilities you maybe did before that you can now do electronically, which is pretty powerful if you know how to harness back to the design and think about how you may be doing this going through. Yeah, so the, I think the trick is when you're using anything, it's just a practice so that the that whatever the technique is doesn't get in the way of it, the process doesn't get in the way of what you're trying to, to have the outcome be 
So, you know, if you haven't done it before, then get set up a meeting with a coworker and, and practice using it, get comfortable with it. All right, so once we get the preparation in play, then we have the event um, with, with some kickoff and some expectations, the technique and the uh, report out or results. We're going to walk through a little bit of that in some more slides. And then we have to figure out like what happens afterwards. We've, we've, we've cre captured all this knowledge. How do we update it? How do we, um, how do we share it? How do we communicate it? And how do we make sure that uh, the work that's been identified in there gets followed through and actually gets completed? So kickoff, I, I want to talk about the importance of a kickoff. And this is not a kickoff meeting, but kind of the kickoff of, of the work. And it, it's not even the kickoff of a project. It's like we're, when we get together, we want to share expectations. It's kind of like when you get on this webinar, the first thing you need you see is, a, hey, welcome, glad you're here. Before we start, check the technology. Here's a link. You know, if you want, you can read the information on the bios of the presenters below. Right. It's giving it's orienting people to why we're here and what the purpose is and what that outcome should be. We all want to know when we're someplace. Why are we here? What do we get out of it? What should we pay attention to? What's important? Right. So this is slide is just a sample only. Um, it's something that I used when I'm when I'm doing in team project planning. I let, I'm a huge proponent of collaborative planning. I like to say that. Um, we're all limited by our experience. No matter how great your experience is, it, it affects how you see things, how you interpret things, and how you approach planning things. So if we get, get different people in the room, we're going to get different perspectives. We're going to end up with a more complete understanding of what needs to be done. Um, and a lot of times getting the sponsor or somebody in that role or some business person in there to share why something is, why are we doing this? What's the purpose behind it? It really engages your resources uh, much more effectively. Um, it gives them exposure to those people in the organization and then helps them understand the why. Okay. Uh, how about if we move on? <laughs> I, I, I want to talk about this. Should, yeah. <laughs> the first thing we need to do is let Dave talk about Elmo. <laughs> how many of you are familiar with who Elmo is or what an Elmo is? Um, and we, we're talking about setting expectations here. So, Within project teams, especially more agile teams, you'll see, see like team working agreements and some of that, which is kind of what these expectations are. But Elmo, and we got him down there a little bit farther because I don't think we really need to spend a lot of time on the other things, but we do need to pay attention to him. Elmo stands for enough. Let's move on. Everybody gets a couple Elmos because we've all been in meetings where we just start beating this horse to death and everybody needs to add their piece and pile on and pile on. And you end up a lot of cycles and a lot of times demotivating some people by elaborating on that product. That's why I put this picture, this funny little red Muppet up and say, you're allowed a couple Elmos and all you do enough, let's move on. No, you don't need to explain anything or it's an understood. And again, the respect is there, you know, okay, I probably have done more than this. And you're going to deal with initial, oh, well, but before we do, I want to I, like, no, we'll expect, we'll respect that person's Elmo. And it also helps to get an atmosphere of, you know, again, the trust and the um, collaborative and, and all that, that, that we're working together because, um, it helps to let people know up front that we realize we're human. Sometimes we get a little carried away. And you're supposed to Elmo me here, Linda, because I'm going on too long with this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> As you can tell, we did rehearse it. But, um, Elmo. I, 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 call, nice. I call Elmo. Okay. You only have um, one left. <laughs> yeah. I, I Actually... My mind, see, like if you don't know most somebody, what happens is your mind wanders someplace else, uh, right? Uh, so uh, what I would love to share one thing on the slide, and that is that um, if you set expectations, make it collaborative. Nobody wants to be told, hey, this is the ex expectations for this session, right? It's like we want to be able to work together effectively. Here's some ideas. Um, is there anything else uh, that needs to be added to the list? Um, and I think that's really important. Um, yeah. Another one you have here, Lee Stripes at the door. Um, I want to share a story. I once got the great opportunity to see Gene Krantz and James Lovell speak. And I don't know if you know who they are. James Lovell was the commander of Apollo 13 up in space. Gene Krantz was the head of uh, command control at NASA. 
And um, Gene Kranz said, especially through the crisis of Hall 13, he would tell people to check the ego at the door. And he would literally, if he thought somebody was getting a little difficult to work with and overbearing, he'd ask them, go get a cup of coffee, 15 minutes, come back. When you come back, check your ego at the door. And the way how he told the story, which I tend to believe is, people respected that. And they went and they came back trying to be more collaborative. And quite frankly, in that environment, over time, if you weren't, you you got weeded out. So that culture part plays such a role. And as the as the lead of these things, you sort of nurture the culture along. So yeah, don't, yeah, don't feel you story. have to make everybody happy. <laughs> I had a I had a um a, a client I was working with and the uh the leader in the organization. Uh, stood at the door and said, the next two hours you guys are going to be in this room. There's nothing more important in the whole organization that's going on. So I'm collecting all your electronics. And they collected everyone's electronics and said, I'm, I'll be out here at the door with them. If, if anything happens, you know, it'll be fine. But um, I thought that was really interesting. All right. That, that was a, a, a great model of um, how the focus needs to be on what you're doing while you're doing it and not so multitasking that you're not paying attention. That was a great way to reinforce it at a leadership level. Okay. All right. So um, we're going to talk about some techniques. Actually, I think I slipped through a slide. There we go. So all, all the techniques that you think about in project management, most of them can be done in some manner of, um, of planning in a collaborative way. It's, they're not like tasks for one person, right? Risk management is, I think, the easiest one to think about um, in terms of being collaborative. If you're doing risk management, it's not one person's job. It's everyone's job to think about what's the uncertainty in the areas that they're involved in um, and how might it impact the, the, the project and, and how are we going to manage that. But whether it's that, that or the goal or lessons learned or stakeholders or deliverables, work, uh, timeline, all the, all the standard pieces that need to be done for any project in any methodology, right, is something that should be done collaboratively. Yep. Uh, can we go back to that for just a second? I'll take a little long because this is, this is a plug. Um, the reason why I bring it up, notice in the lower right, the graphic. Um, this actually, Linda has a great book that talks about all this. That we maybe mention a little bit later, but the use of visualization and simple visual, simple sketches and things like that to help supplement the topic and let people build on it and draw the thing together is an extremely powerful collaboration technique. I, I admit it's a little bit more difficult in a virtual world than in the back and then in a face-to-face uh, -face. but don't feel that you're limited to just one particular channel of communication and maybe writing notes on a whiteboard and you can communicate a lot through crude flow charts arrows from here to there you know little squiggly lines for network and all those different things and start to bring in some of the different stuff and I've actually been in some meetings where we've had some artists using people took pictures of the meeting minutes <laughs> because it was done graphically. And, you know, first time I saw that people are taking pictures of the meeting minutes. That's pretty neat. So I had a client I worked with that brought in a cartoonist who took the notes um, on a whiteboard and that was amazing. And they were really powerful and they were referred to. Right. That was how we documented yep. the project plan. So much more creative than the, the pictures you're going to see here. These are um, uh, no color means has any meaning sticky notes. Um, and one of the first things, Dave, and I want to talk about is lessons learned, because we really feel powerfully that this is an important part that gets missed out in a lot of planning. And this is where collaboration can be really important is um uh, having everyone bring the things that have gone well on past projects or the things they want to avoid on last projects to um, the fruition on this project so that we can leverage each other's learning. I like it for a couple of reasons. One is that it, it's one way early on in, in collaborative planning to, to model the fact that, hey, what you're bringing to the table is valuable. I want to hear what you have to say. So tell me what you've done before on recent projects that were really helpful that we should integrate and things that you want to avoid. Um, and this is, uh, you know, a very simple way to do, to do it. In this case, it was a, a in in person setting, so we were using physical sticky notes. 
Yep. And again, no, nothing really to add. Just as I mentioned before, don't try to leave, bring too much intelligence into unintelligent sticky notes. <laughs> yeah. And, the, and the, so these techniques too, just like any techniques in project management, it doesn't have to be like, oh, we're doing this early in the planning process. Great if you do, but like we can gather lessons learned throughout the project. We've rolled a little piece out. Let's do some more lessons learned. We've, you know, we've, we've just managed this risk productively. Let's, let's do some lessons learned. So it does, it's not a one-time event. It's something we can revisit. Um, and the other thing you want to say is like, you got to audit your plan against it. So this is how I use it. When we, once we create it, then I go through, we go through each sticky and we say like, is this best practice embedded in the process? And if not, how do we get it in there? Right. Um, so we want to make sure that it's not just a, like, well, we've, we've heard you and have this conversation, but we've heard you and we're going to figure out how to do this stuff because because you've said that it's helpful. Yeah. And another thing, just on lessons learned in general from your project, I've been involved in very few organizations where they would spend on the agenda. We're going to look at a lessons learned and talk about what we learned from there so we can either recreate it and that's because it was positive or avoid it from happening so lessons learned is a very effective topic in collaboration to help us have this communication too often we have lessons ignored <laughs> or somebody may go and look at an old lessons learned document and put two bullet points on a slide that we're gonna you know use these lessons learned and then it goes off into the digital junk drawer so it's an effective tool for collaboration to look at what our lessons learned and how, yeah. again, how can we maximize the things that were good and how can we avoid the things that were bad? Yeah, so we don't want to elmo this topic too long, but we think it, we both of us agree passionately about like, this is something that needs to happen. It needs to happen collaboratively. We get a lot of value out of it. Yep. All right, we want to, um, stakeholders. You want to you want to cover stakeholders, Dave, or you want me to? Um, well, I'd say this is akin to the word empathy too. Um, yeah. What success looks like for the stakeholder, so it's just part of that again psychological safety, the trust, and all those other things. And this is a technique to be able to implement that concept. And the power of doing it collaboratively is that it's not my functional or silos perspective of who the stakeholders are, but it's a broader understanding of who they are and wh who's important. So I know, know whose needs we have to satisfy versus whose needs we have to understand, but you know, maintain within the scope of the project. So having this common vision of understanding who, who the stakeholders are and what their success criteria is, that'll help us figure out as we build our plan, are we meeting the criteria of those key stakeholders? Right. And again, a common understanding of why we're doing what we're doing to the project. Okay. All right. Uh, I have a few things to say about goals and then you're welcome to jump in. <laughs> uh, Dave. Um, but like goal to me, goals are the understated least used technique that drives so much value. Right. A lot of times you talk about like, how do we get people on the bus facing the same direction, going to the same place? We want to get the whole team working together, moving together. How do we do that? Right. We have to have a common goal. We have to be able to define what we're going to how we succeed, what success looks like, how we know we're done. But we have to do it succinctly. And we can't just as project managers um, state it. When, when I do planning workshops, we start with the goal, right? That's given to us by leadership, um, or at least the the um, understanding of what our project is. But after we put our plan together, we always go back and have a discussion about um, now that we understand more details, we've got we've got into the the planning process. We understand what's under the hood, how we're going to get this done. How would we articulate our goal now? Would we modify it because we have more knowledge? And usually um, it gets some 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 clarity and some modification and becomes more people become more engaged and really own the project goal as opposed to just being, you know, something on the on a slide that someone told them, you know, here's the mantra of why we're doing this. Yeah. And if we go back to setting up, having the goal out there and defined is critical to success. And I'll again relate this to the disciplined agile world. Discipline Agile talks as you go to a planning session for like planning and iteration. If you're in a scrum world, first thing you really need to do is define what's the goal I want to do 
in my next iteration. And then you do some sort of analysis. What's the context of where I'm at? How mature is my team? How good is their relationship together? How well do we understand the problem itself and et cetera? So based on the goal and the context of where I am, I should be able to choose one of several practices, tools, techniques, whatever term we want to use to help us tackle that help us go with the approach. And that's a good thing to be able to do within a collaborative session. Here's my goal and talk about what's our current context. And then here's some choices, maybe brainstorm some choices to be able to go forward with that. And again, it fosters the team, the self-governing team, all those things that are very uh, helpful in meeting the shorter time to market, higher value, those other things we talked about to begin with. So goals, going to permeate throughout the entire di dialogue and should always be able to bring people back to focus, bring people back to the goal. So as a facilitator of these meetings, that's your pivot point to make sure that we come back to focus on. Yeah, and I love to thank for bringing in the different techniques you can use to do this. So this is not this is not just a waterfall. This is not just an agile. This is not just a discipline, right? These are there's lots of different yeah techniques and tools that will help us clarify our goals, whether we're doing it at the program level, the project level, a sprint level, right? We're, we're, um, we, we have a lot of variability in terms of how we can apply it. Yeah. And at strategic levels, I mean, again, this, this, has, this is not just project centric stuff. And as project managers, we aren't just project managers, these techniques. We have a whole bunch of skills that can apply everywhere across the business. And we do apply them everywhere. Uh, just like with analysis. I mean, business analysis isn't just writing requirements. It's analysis. I have a piece of data. How did it get to the this way? What's going to change with it if I do a certain activity? So that goal piece really can help move along and, and drive some good discussion and collaborative environment to get a better project plan, which is what we talked about back to goal of this, of this presentation. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so <laughs> let, let's do that. And, and Elmo me, let's move on. All right. So I've, I have moved on. Um, the last technique we're going to talk about here is just um, communications. Again, something that you might think like, oh, somebody can just sit down and pound it out of a computer, route it around for people to review it, but really doing it collaboratively, like, who are all our stakeholders that we have to talk to? You know, what do they need to know? How often do they need to know it? What's the best way to get that information to them? Who's going to get that information to them? That the communication is owned by the team, not just by the project manager, right? So how, how are we going to disperse that? How are we going to manage that? What's our approach to that? Um, again, something that's really valuable done collaboratively. The most unique approach I've used to creating a communication plan is I had a globally diverse team. And so, and they were all working remotely. I had everyone make a communication plan that listed them as the who. So my, you know, and the who would go Linda and here's what I need to know for the project and when I need to know it and how I want to get it and who I think should give it to me and how I'll validate that I receive that information and what my feedback loop will be. And it was really powerful for the team to understand how much communication was necessary in a, um, in a globally, diverse team, geographically diverse team. And we've all learned that right through this COVID that we have to be much more intentional about communication. So what a great thing to, to create a communication plan for our project collaboratively as well. Yep. And there's a lot of value in just having conversation. I'm going to reference something that folks, if you want to, if you're familiar with projectmanagement.com, previous webinars, you can go find out on, we actually did a session with a couple other people on communication improv and how with these sessions, how you can just do an improvisation, improv, I do improv. <laughs> <laughs> But generate, the generate the conversation and sort of yeah. guide good dialogue. You know, we don't need to use all the corporate buzzwords and things like that, but just the dialogue and build upon other people's thoughts and work together as a team. Uh, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. But you can salt their oats. That's a phrase my dad used to say. When you I was can a little, salt their oats. Nice. To make them want to drink. And that's yeah. how I see the role of this, of the collaboration leader doing. 
So let me st let me share a story about that, um, about salting someone's oats um, real quick. And that I was running collaboration sessions. Again, a lot of this is the pictures and stuff come from pre-COVID when we were physically together, right? Um, and people would get to the meeting and the executives would be there and kick off and tell why it's so important. And then they would leave. And then people would be like, do we have to stay too? Because who wants to be in an all day planning session, right? It just seems like so boring and a waste of time. But what would happen in these sessions is 20 minutes in, they would say, hey, we're missing so-and-so from this department. Can, they, can I call them? Can they come in? Right. And by the end of the, by, you know, a couple hours into it, you're like, everyone's fully engaged and working and sharing their ideas and stuff. And so they've engaged in planning, real collaboration, right? M much more success in terms of uh, project implementation as well, because everyone understands the whole picture, not just the one little point. Um, so um, getting people to try collaboration, I think, is a way to salt the oats to get them to want to do it more often, right? Um, it'll be one of their best practices that they want to bring into to future planning of work. All right, so this last yeah. slide in terms of this section here just talks about like, it's great that you've created it and you've collaborated, but uh, the people that weren't in the collaboration also need to know about it too. So you need to figure out how do we share this information with people that weren't in the room, even though you're not maybe physically in the room, right? But that weren't there. Um, and how do we make sure that we, um, have ownership of our action plans that come out of that. Yeah. All hey, right. Hey, and Dave, there, Dave, there is a question under oh. the chat session. Under oh, chat. I'm sorry. It's at the top, not at the bottom. I've been looking at the bottom. <laughs> yeah. but, but looking at chat, the chat yeah. window, the question from Gerard at the bottom. Oh, okay. I was looking at the Q&A and Jennifer has a question. So I'll go to chat first. Gerard, how do you handle modality preferences, visual seeking artifacts to review rather than auditive, wanting to hash out together versus joint collaboration, which appears to favor those preferring auditive interactions? So I guess how you get the diversity across learning styles and media preferences. So Linda, I'll get the question there. I don't know why I can't see it. So it's under it's chat. It's under chat. Yeah, it's the bottom of chat. And Gerald said yes. So thank you. Um, how do you handle it? Can you, I, for some reason, I can't see <laughs> okay. it. So I'm going to ask you to read it to me again. Okay. How do you handle modality preferences? For instance, visual seeking artifacts to review rather than auditive wanting to hash out together in the paren versus joint collaboration, which appears to favor those preferring auditive interactions. So how do you balance the different learning styles? So learning yeah. styles. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll, we'll focus on that one. Um, I, I think, I think, I think if you can be in person, you can address a lot of those things because people that are wanting to see things, or wanting to experience things or wanting to talk through things, it provides a lot of different approaches in a, in a dynamic environment that allows people to um, engage based on the, the learning style that's most effective for them, right? So somebody wants to like, you know, I have a handout of something, they can read through the handout, they can, you, you know, we can do some table team discussions about it. So really the design of the, of the, of, of a working session needs to be aware of the fact that people have different um, disc styles or Myers-Briggs styles or learning styles and all those different pieces come into play. So we wanna try and create a, um, a working session that allows people to leverage their style um, and while still collaborating. Absolutely. Try to use them as much as possible. Another thing I find myself trying to do, especially with learning style, I use verbs that do align with them. For example, I may say, I see exactly what you're talking about for visual learners. Or, Linda, I hear you for auditory learners or for hands-on learners. Say, hey, let's roll up our sleeves and get dirty. So I physically try to, and actually a lot of times when I write reviews or do PowerPoints, I will do bullet points, making sure I have each one of those verbs. And I even do it in different colors to mentally make me do it just in order to try to hit those different modalities. 
And I so, think if you have a if you have a team if you have an intact team that's going to work together, then it's worth doing um, investing a little time and and taking an instrument that, where you where you where you learn those things, right? And then you can then you can um, talk about them. Yeah, right. Back to the design piece. Right. Then, yeah. Um, one also had Jennifer has a comment in Q and A, and has anyone. And I like this phrase, been successful using the whiteboard app in Microsoft 365 on Teams. If so, where do you find training materials? I find it hard to be very cumbersome. Um, I asked anybody who responds to that to put it in here. Um, Jennifer, you bring up a good point. I haven't done a lot with the whiteboard, that particular whiteboard, but I have been involved with people trying to bring in tools that seem to be neat collaborative tools, but they're cumbersome, bulky, and not everybody can grasp them right away. And so it does sort of distract it. Back again, when Linda was talking about the planning sessions and that and design, you need to make sure that you have walked through different scenarios so those tools will work. And yes, I agree, whiteboard can be cumbersome because one, one of the things it does is it brings in a new channel or it takes your attention away from what you're currently looking at. And now you're focusing on somebody else and it needs to be nurtured. So I, as a facilitator, you really, you can't be the facilitator and the scribe taking the notes. You need to have some of those roles defined up front. And same here within, you know, using like a, a whiteboard, you can't be trying to run the meeting and trying to navigate through the whiteboard and do the working and, you know, those of you that have word right, used whiteboards, you probably have encountered this. You try to add text and the font is screwy and people can't read it. Or it's a white text and nobody can read it. Just those little technical snafus that happen. But thank you for bringing that up as a, you know, it's a particular technology. But clearly, as all these new and more and more things start coming on board with virtual technology to work, you need to plan them in your design and how you're going to use it. And make and you it need, be as, as seamless as possible. Yeah, and you need to practice them because what you don't want is the technology to drive the the, the meeting. I I actually have a wall painted in one of my offices now that's a whiteboard wall. I was in a virtual meeting with somebody, and he in his office had a whiteboard behind him, and he just stood up, and his camera was set up such that he could write on it, and you could see it. And I was like, that that is so powerful to be able to see that. I need to be able to do that. So I now have a moving, like a like a stand-up desk that I can change the height on where I can put my computer with my camera on it and I can write on the whiteboard and I can move around. It's a big wall. I can move around and focus in on certain stuff. So I'm trying to simulate, right? Always remotely, we're trying to simulate the good things of being physically together. Um, so um, that's, that's a simple non-technical alternative um, that I did because I saw someone do it and I was like, wow. That's great. Hey, Linda, I want to do a time check with you. We got about 10 minutes left. Right, right. And so we're already talking about I appreciate about the dialogue and all that. It, it's wonderful. <laughs> and I'm going to Elmo because I have a story to go with this, but I'll, I'll pass it. <laughs> okay. Well, you've talked about the facilitator already, right? So um, in the next few slides, we can go through pretty quickly. There's a lot of content on them that you guys can like take a look at later. Um, but uh, Dave's already talked about this. It's hard to be a facilitator and a contributor. So somebody neutral needs to play this role that's really focused, um, keeping, keeping the team focused, managing the progress, helping them get to success, um, helping to facilitate all the positive parts of the environment that are necessary for collaboration. And obviously they're working closely with the sponsor and the project manager um, in terms of making sure that they're aligned. And in this part, they're at a flip chart, but you know, they could be at a computer. Um, I've done working sessions online where I might have, I might be facilitating and I might be using my whiteboard, but I also have somebody who is um, re remote in another location and they're they're capturing things electronically. So they're writing Word documents and things like that. Um, their, their role is a scribe and they're capturing in, the, in, in tools so that the conversation can be more free flowing and not be constricted by the tool, but the outcome still comes in the tool um, as a second step. It's more um, labor intensive, but um, if you have the luxury of doing that, that's an option as well. So we're going to jump through real quick the different roles as part of collaborated session and just um, highlight some of the preparation, what happens during the work and what happens post work. And again, we're not going to belabor any of this, but um, you have it as a reference to you. We've talked about the facilitator. Um, you have anything to add there? 
No. Okay. Um, sponsors. I think sponsors are people who need, we need to set expectations for them, right? If they're going to be, if they're going to come and be part of a, a kickoff, then we need to meet with them and say, hey, this is why we need you. This is how you fit in. This is what your role is. This is how we want you to participate. I've had sponsors that I, you know, that talk about the stripes on the door. I said, hey, once we, once you kick it off, I'd like you to leave the room because I want to make sure that everybody can share what they need to share. And with your rank, you know, sometimes people are going to be just too cautious, so they're not going to share things. So if you can walk away and come back at the end, right? Um, so just knowing who those people are, setting expectations about what expectations are for them is really important. Yep, and the importance of their presence, just their presence there adds a much better aura of importance for what you're doing. Yes, yeah, Keep, gets people engaged and understands the importance of it. All right, we've got the project manager doing a lot of the logistics, oops. And again, if the project manager is not the facilitator, then they can actually participate in the planning session as opposed to um, trying to scribe and trying to make sure everyone's had a voice and trying to make sure that um, we're using all the right action words, like Dave said, so that we're you know allowing people to be active, to be listening, to be participating, to be uh, visually seeing things. Um, yep, let's move on. All right. So we've got the BA role. If you have the ability to have someone who's playing the role of the business analyst, right, if that's a part of your project, then they need to be actively engaged in this process as well. Um, if you don't, and that's a project manager or another team member that's playing that role, then you're wearing the dual hats. But there's still an, an active participation and a perspective that needs to be brought in from a business analyst. And again, we're just talking about managing expectations here. So we're doing it by role so that there's some clarity there. We have the same thing for participants. If there's any prep work that needs to be done, um, getting support for them to be there, um, setting the right environment so they can actively participate, and then making sure that they do uh, post work or completion um, follow up afterwards is important. Um, and then if we have the ability to have a scribe, right? Getting them prepared, having them have the templates or forms or the software, having them be fluent in that software so that they can support the facilitator and capture those critical notes um, and then get that documentation distributed post. And my experience with this, as much as you can capture it, the time is good because regardless of the great intentions, when you walk away from the room or the environment, other things get in the way and it could be delayed and delayed and other things. So, um, you need to, to give it a, as immediate attention as possible. And I've done I've done workshops where we've had a, um, a, a you know no scribe that the team agrees to scribe or a bigger workshop where there's one scribe and I've had large workshops um, with up to fifty people and more we've had three scribes capturing different things so that to Dave's point you want everything done when you leave the room because everyone's mind leaves with them when they leave yep. that room. And a technical change that has happened the last couple of years is the cell phone and taking photographs. So I've seen yeah. lots of that um, yeah. exchanging. And so use it. I'm not sure how good that is to do photographs online, but there's screen capture utilities and those other things. And those a lot of times are just good reference points. So in summary, Dave and I are huge proponents, and I hope that you felt this way coming in and feel more that way after hearing um, our discussion today, that good collaboration drives innovation, improves alignment, it reduces um, uh, time to execution of a project, right? We're gonna, get, we're gonna get better things done faster when we have a common understanding, we work together when everyone's had an equal voice, when people feel um, like they're part of the team, that they're gonna be rewarded, um, we're going to share and we're going to share the success and share the hurdles um, as well. So collaboration co requires uh, commitment to the tools, to the physical space, to the psychological environment, right, that we're setting up here in terms of being a positive environment. So this is not something that you can just say, hey, let's all get on the phone or let's go all set up a Zoom and, you know, we're going to collaborate. It requires commitment. It requires planning um, and preparation, which is why in all the slides we talk about, what do you have to do to prepare for it, for it to be effective? You can't just walk in there um, and have it occur. And 
I'll leave with these parting thoughts. Uh, we're dealing with people here too that have emotions and sometimes they may get carried away, et cetera. Your job is to focus back again to the goal and what we're trying to do. If you need to take action to everybody, let's take a break. You know, the old Thomas Jefferson thing, if you get angry, push away from the table, count to 10 and then count to 100. You're going to have to, to make sure that flow. And again, it's not that anybody's necessarily doing things wrong. It just is sometimes and we, we can get emotional about things and your job primary as a facilitator is to keep the discussions flowing toward meeting the objectives and the goals. And sometimes that isn't easy to do. It's not but always you, easy to yes. do. I, 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 when I'm coaching project managers, I always say that um, once you're, once you understand the project management stuff, facilitation is the next skill set you really need to build because your job is getting things done through others and facilitation allows that to happen. It, allow, it allows you to engage people in a respectful ways um, and to have productive conversations with them, which builds and, the collaboration. And if I'm hiring a project manager, I'd rather, I'd take a person with facilitation skills over who they can make a better, prettier WBS. <laughs> I, okay. Couldn't, couldn't so, agree more. Yep, I guess Brian will Yes. Pass the baton back to you. Thank you. Linda Day, thank you for spending your time with us today and your preparation for this event. On behalf of the chapter, we really do appreciate um, you taking the time to um, help us improve our project management skill set. Um, for the uh, chapter members, uh, remember we take a break during July and August for Lunch and Learns. We'll be back in September. We have Dave from Project Bites is going to join us in September for a uh, review of their um, tools, if you will. So we, we'll see you then. Um, the material that was presented today will be emailed out as usual within the next few days from a chapter email. So be watching your email um, inbox for this, the content. And um, everyone have a terrific summer. We hope to see you in September. OK, thank you. Thank you, you very much. I want to leave you with one thought. It's an earworm. You guys will never be able to see Sesame Street again without thinking about Project Elmo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Take care. Yep. Bye.